In this portion of the series, I will review with you the ultrasound evaluation of the ankle and the foot. I'll discuss the technique for patient positioning and for scanning. I will also review some of the basic anatomy and show you the pictures you should be able to identify using the ultrasound. And at the end of the series, I will review with you some of the clinical correlations when evaluating ankle and foot pathology. As usual, one of the key things for doing ultrasound scanning is patient positioning. For looking at ankle and foot structures, it is best to use a transducer of at least 12 megahertz. The patient is placed supine on an examination table for the dorsal scans with the examiner seated at the patient's feet. And for the plantar scans, it is best to have the patient examined prone. When obtaining images of the ankle and the foot, it is best to first start proximally and scan distally on the ultrasound. Let's now review some of the anatomy. This is an image showing you the basic bony structures of the ankle and the foot. You're familiar with the tibula and the fibula, but we want to pay more detailed attention to the bones of the ankle and of the feet. Here you can see in greater detail the talar and the navicular bones. And actually coming more distally, you may look at and identify the cuneiform bones. Remember there are three of them, starting on the medial most aspect, the medial, there's an intermediate, and there's a lateral cuneiform bone. And lateral to that, you will see that you also have the cuboids. You can visualize here the metatarsal joints and also the portions of the metatarsal phalangeal joints. An image looking at the lateral ankle can identify the major tendon structures that we will look at. You can see the bands of tissue that help to stabilize the ankle. Part of these comprise the deltoid ligament. Wrapping right around the lateral malleolus, you will see two tendons that we will identify, the peroneus brevis and the peroneus longus. You also have some vascular structures here, but they're not as of significant concern when looking at ankle pathology. Looking at the medial anatomy of the ankle, you will see several key structures. You definitely see the huge retinaculum that helps to stabilize the ankle. And then posterior to the medial malleolus, you will see several tendons and other neurovascular structures. We will identify the tibialis posterior, the flexor pollicis longus, and you will also be able to identify the flexor hallucis longus. Before reaching the flexor hallucis longus, you will also see a neurovascular bundle. This is the portion that comprises the tarsal tunnel. And looking at the basic anatomy from the posterior aspect, the biggest thing that we will focus on will be the Achilles tendon, looking at its site of insertion into the calcaneal bone, and then we will scan distally to look at the plantar fascia. There are several scans that are usually performed to evaluate both the ankle and for the foot, and they are outlined here. The anterior longitudinal scan, the anterior transverse scan, and then we will actually look at the different parts of the ankles as far as the malleolar regions. You have the medial aspect, both the longitudinal and transverse, and then the lateral aspect, again, looking at a longitudinal and a transverse orientation. The posterior scans we'll look at also in the longitudinal and transverse aspects. The plantar scans, we'll see there are two quick and easy scans to obtain, and then also we'll look at the dorsal longitudinal and transverse scans. When evaluating the small joints of the feet, for example, the MTPs, we usually look at the first and the fifth, because this is where you will see most of the pathology, and especially in people with inflammatory conditions. Let's first start off by looking at the anterior longitudinal scan. This slide demonstrates the location of the transducer, and in the view you should be able to pick up the tibula, and also should be able to see the Taylor joint. Let's obtain these structures on the ultrasound. Let's first show you how I usually position my patients. Even though the patients may be lying down when doing the evaluation, I like to have the patient sitting up. The knee is slightly flexed. I use a small pillow under the knee so as not to have any tension on the ankle or the foot so that the foot is not into a plantar or a dorsiflex position. You want to have a very neutral position. Uh, as you look at the medial aspect, and the lateral aspects here, to obtain the first image, we'll actually look at the anterior longitudinal image to identify our two bony structures. Again, remember there are several curves and tendons and bony structures around the ankle, so you want to compensate for any anisotropy by using excess gel. 
Also remember to make sure you maximize your focal points in the area of interest. And in this case, I want to focus on the bones. So the two bony structures we will see here, remember the left side of the screen is going to be medial. The right side is going to be um, proximal or distal. We see the, the hyperechoic region of the tibula. And then to the right of that, we see the hyperechoic region of the talus. In this patient, you actually see the articular cartilage surface is there. And between the joint, the tibular talar joint, there is a recess. And this is a site where you might see fluid accumulation in patients who have inflammatory arthritis, or in some patients, in patients who have um, things like gout. So the anterior longitudinal scan. The next, we will look at the anterior transverse scan. Keeping your orientation correct, we will essentially rotate the transducer 90 degrees. And again, because we're over regions where you have the extensor tendons here, I will compensate by using some excess gel to get rid of any anisotropy. And the joint that we see in the most here is what we saw in the longitudinal scan, is looking at the Taylor joint. Here you can see the articular surface of it, and this would be the area of the recess there. There's some other superficial tendons and blood vessels that are there, but are not a significant area of interest when dealing with musculoskeletal um, pathology. The next image we will obtain will be looking at the medial aspect of the ankles. We will focus on those areas around the malleolus. I will first start with the longitudinal orientation, and actually it's not a true longitudinal because to identify the tendinous structures of interest, the transducer should be held more at an oblique angle. Again, remember because of the bony landmarks and sharp drop-offs of this region, you can compensate for any anisotropy by using excess gel. So as we look at the images on the screen here, first identify the hyperechoic signal for the medial malleolus. The anisotropy that is seen here on the left because there's areas that is not in contact with the skin, and we can compensate that by slightly moving the transducer. We want to focus on the middle of the screen because here we'll see the medial malleolus, and above that we're going to see closely abutted to each other two tendinous structures if we lift the transducer slightly back and forth. The most superficial would be the tibialis posterior, and right underneath that would be the flexor pollicis longus. So again, medial malleolus, tibialis posterior, and the flexor pollicis longus. Next, we'll obtain the transverse image of the medial malleolus. In this case, I'm going to change the orientation of my transducer and again, take advantage of some excess gel to compensate for any anisotropy. The reason I wanted to change the transducer, so the left part of the screen is going to be the most distal structure, which we will first identify is going to be the tibialis posterior. So if you look at this slide here, it shows the first structure will be the tibialis posterior. Next to that would be the flexor pollicis longus. And then posterior to that, we have the flexor hollicis longus. That tendon is preceded by a neurovascular bundle and nerve that com comprises the tarsal tunnel. And let's identify those structures. So first, identifying your bony landmarks, which is the medial malleolus. The first tendon that we were encounter is going to be the tibialis posterior. Next to that, we will see in cross-section here the flexor pollicis longus. And then if I scan posteriorly, and again shift in the transducer to compensate for any anisotropy, we see a region where in most patients you will have an artery and two veins. And as you can see here, I can compress the vein, whereas the arteries continues to pulsate slightly inferior to those vessels, you actually can identify the tibial nerve. Again, this is a region where you have the tarsal tunnel. And if we sh shift slightly posterior to that, this will be the region, the fibrillar pattern that you will identify for the flexohollis longus. So again, going from more anterior to posterior, here you see your medial malleolus, tibialis posterior, flexopolysis longus, the neurovascular bundle that comprises the tarsal tunnel, and then the fibrillar pattern of the flexor hollicis longus in this region here.
Let's now look at the lateral malleolar region in transverse orientation. In this case, again, keeping the transducer oriented so that the lateral malleolus is going to be your brightest region, which you can see right at the tip of the arrow. The areas of interest will be the two tendinous structures that we will see in cross section, the peroneus brevis, which is going to butt the lateral malleolus, and the peroneus longus, which will overlie that. And again, that area is where we want to focus on. And as I focus back and forth, making sure we can see all those fibrils in cross sections, making sure they're not dispersed, which would represent tendinosis, and if they were had an increased signal on the Doppler, which would recommend, represent tendinitis, and those are actually fine. There's a common sheath that surround those, and we can actually see that in this region. So again, lateral malleolus, peroneus brevis, and peroneus longus. The next image we will obtain will be the posterior scans of the ankles. And in this case, we're going to reposition the patient so that we can look at the posterior portion of the ankle. So now we will look at the series of posterior scans when looking at the foot and the ankle. In this case, we have the patient who is now lying prone so that we can expose the areas of the Achilles tendon and looking at the plantar surface of the foot. Again, I like to use a pillow to elevate the leg so that they're not cutting into the bony surface of the examination table. The two simple posterior scans that we'll look at will first be the longitudinal scan where we really want to focus on the Achilles tendon and pay most attention where it begins to insert onto the calcaneal bone. Again, because this is a sharp bony surface, I've taken advantage of using some excess gel to compensate for any areas of anisotropy. This is one of the best areas to begin to um, obtain scans, particularly when looking at ultrasound images uh, for beginners because it shows all of these structures that you want to identify um, on, on a typical um, ultrasound image. We will first look at the hyperachoric region of the skin, the hyperachoric or isoachoric region of the subcutaneous tissue, and then you will see the Achilles tendon here as it comes down and attaches to the calcaneal bone. One of the things you want to do is take advantage of is rotating a probe left and right, back and forth to make sure that there is no areas of, of anechoic regions inside of the Achilles tendon. Now you will see right in this region here as those fibers come down and then dive at a 90 degree angle to the, um, to the calcaneal bone, you lose those tendons. So what you can do is essentially just tilt the probe transducer so you can begin to pick those up. So doing this kind of motion with the transducer if you look in that region, you now begin to see those tendons as they attach into the calcaneal bone. So this is going to be skin, the Achilles tendon, as it attaches in the calcaneal bone. The other area of interest in this part of the ankle is going to be the area where there's a retrocalcaneal bursa. Remember that the bursa is a potential space, so in normal individuals like the model, you will not see any fluid. But if a patient had gout or an inflammatory arthritis, this will be the area that you would see a compressible region of hypoechoic signal. The next scan we will obtain will be the transverse orientation looking at this region. And you should be able to identify essentially two things. I will first use some more gel. The most medial and lateral aspects of the screen will be off of the um, image because there's no contact with any of this of the skin or of a body. What we will identify though is the Achilles tendon that we will see in transsection, cross section as it abuts over the calcaneal bone. So as I scan up further with that we see the nice fibula pattern of the Achilles tendon looking at those fibers on long view and you can see it just as it abuts into the calcaneal bone scanning back and forth around that and making sure there's no fluid that has accumulated into the Achilles tendon itself. Again, the areas on the left and the right of the screen are unavoidable in many patients because the transducer would not make contact with the body. For the next image we will obtain will be the longitudinal view looking at the plantar aspect of the foot. The patient's in the same position and the probe is oriented so that the proximal portion is pointing toward the calcaneus. The biggest things to identify in this particular image we will see, for example, I'll first focus on the big 
tendinous structure, which is going to be the flexor hollis longus. It actually could manipulate the, the, the large digit and actually could see that tendon move. Underneath that, in some patients, you will have, as she has, the sesamoid bone, which is a hyperechoic structure in the middle of the screen. Now, as I focus on the first MTP joint, we can identify several bony structures here. So again, this will be the flexor hollis longus tendon, and this is going to be the metatarsal phalangeal joint of the first joint. Let's go back to a live image to obtain that in better detail. To, to make sure we get the best image, I am putting some pressure contacting the probe tightly to the skin so you can identify the margins of the bony surfaces there. A very nice image looking at the flexor hollis longus tendon, the metatarsal head. Here's the phalanx, and in this region, begin to identify the nice articular structures that you see, particularly the cartilage that coats that joint, and hers is normal. The next image we would like to obtain will be the transverse scan of the plantar aspect of the foot. In this case, you will just take your transducer at 90 degrees and keep it oriented so that the left side of the screen will be medial and the right side of the screen will be lateral. The bony landmark you will see will be the hyperechoic regions of the metatarsal bone. Again, you will see the tendons and cross section here. And I'm precisely over her second and first MTP joints, and those are the two hyperechoic regions that you're seeing. We'll get to a nice structure to identify the bone. So left is medial. This will be the first metatarsal. Sesamoid bone is here. Here's metatarsal. And here's the second metatarsal there, more lateral. The flexor hollis is longest. You can see that in cross section. And then I get some more pressure and contact with the skin to identify those structures in greater detail. In this aspect of the foot, you actually do the same thing in scanning along other aspects of the metatarsal bones. The biggest area you're looking for, for example, patients who have gout or rheumatoid arthritis looking for erosions and looking for any abnormalities in the bony structures. So in this orientation, the transverse scan of the plantar will look at the metatarsal joints, the tendons and cross sections to identify changes in those regions. So for the latter series of scans for the foot, we actually have the patient back so we can look at the dorsal aspects and I'll first look at the longitudinal scans Paying most attention to the larger joints, I will focus on the first MTP. This is a very nice image obtained showing you some of the bony landmarks. You can see here to the left would be the metatarsal head. This is the phalanx. The anechoic region, or the black region here, is going to be the articular cartilage. And you can see hers is nice and smooth. It's very uh, homogeneous. You see a little bit of the fat pad that goes in and helps to kind of coat the joint. And then you see the, the phalanx there. If a patient had um, gout, you would see fluid accumulation, rheumatoid arthritis, you look for erosions and effusions. And actually you see above the joint space, you can actually see the extensor tendon um, of the first MTP. A very simple and easy scan to obtain to identify structures in either normal or a pathologic joint. We will now go to a transverse scan, looking at the same image. I will keep my transducer so the left side of the screen will be medial. And just like we saw on the plantar aspects of the foot, we'll begin to see the bony landmarks of the MTP joints. And I will focus on those. So to the left side of the screen is going to be the first MTP. And if I slide over more lateral, we pick up the second MTP. And we can do the same thing, let's go through and pick up the third and so on. But this is the scans you want to look at. Patients who might have a neuroma, remember between the second and third MTP, you can identify those uh, areas. But she has no structures. You can see some of her normal arteries pulsating between the digits. But that gives you that dorsal transverse scan, very simple and easy scan to obtain. 
And finally, for the lateral scans, uh, to get the most lateral aspects of the joints, we focus on the lateral aspect of the first MTP, and we do the same thing for the fifth MTP. As I've talked about already, the first MTP is a site of a lot of pathology and a lot of discomfort for a number of patients. So again, using some excess gel because of the curvatures of the joint space, we actually will attain a very uh, image that's very similar to the one obtained from the dorsal aspect, shifting back and forth to look at all the aspects of the joint. To the left of the screen is going to be the metatarsal joint, and to the right is going to be the phalanx. And you can see that the articular cartilage in between that. The nice thing about the ultrasound, you actually can scan almost the entire surface of the joint, going from dorsal to lateral to plantar aspects. And we do the same thing from the lateral scan of the first joint, and we can do, obtain a similar type of scan looking at the lateral aspect of the fifth MTP joint. And we see here again, so to the left of the screen is going to be the metatarsal head, to the right is going to be the phalanx, and in between is a hypoechoic area, which represents the articular cartilage. So now that we've obtained all of our standard images of the ankle and the foot, let me give you a few clinical correlations. Remember that the ultrasound is a very nice tool to identify areas of soft tissue swelling like synovitis and effusions. The ankle is often an area that's involved in patients who have inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis or crystal disease such as uric acid deposition in patients with gout. So you can identify effusions and also bursitis. Remember one of the sites you can easily um, identify with the ultrasound is a region around the Achilles tendon, the retrocalcaneal bursa. Like other joints in the body, the ankle and the foot can be involved in bony pathology, patient with the erosive disease such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, or even patients who have spurs from osteoarthritis. Calcifications, crystal deposition like uric acid or uh, calcium pyrophosphate disease, those can be identified. And also patients who have prostheses. We see more patients now who have ankle and small joint surgeries and artificial joints that can also be evaluated with the ultrasound because you cannot use MRI on those patients.